Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, episode number eight. Writers aren't exactly people. There are whole bunches of people trying to be one person. F. Scott Fitzgerald. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Now, after speaking to so many screenwriters out there, I know and I've heard so many times that they want to learn how to produce their own screenplays. They want to produce their own work and have no idea how to do it. Well, I wanted to let you guys know that I just launched a brand new game-changing producing course called the Indie Film Producing Masterclass with award-winning indie film producer Suzanne Lyons. Now, the masterclass focuses on $1 million and below budgets, but all the things you learn there can easily be translated to $100 million if need be. So if you want to learn how to produce your own material, just head over to producingmasterclass.com. Today you are in for a treat because today's guest is Linda Seeger. She is the grand mama of script consulting, script uh, teaching. She's been doing this for over 30 years, coaching uh, screenwriters, and she has consulted in over 2,000 screenplays and over 100 produced films and television shows. She has worked with clients like Peter Jackson, Sony Pictures, and Ray Bradbury, and even Ron Howard gives her a very high endorsement and says he uses her book on the making of all of his films and started using that book on Apollo 13, which I think he won the Oscar for. Now, that's not too bad of an endorsement, but uh, Linda is also very famous for writing a book called Making a Good Script Great, which is pretty much standard on every screenwriter's uh, bookshelf if it's not there you should get it right now. Uh, but you get all the links to any of her books at the end of the show in the show notes. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Linda Seeger. So for uh, for those of you, for, for those of uh, in the audience who are unfamiliar with your work, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your history and what you do? I am a script consultant, and I was actually the first script consultant. I made up the name. I made up the job in 1981. I've worked on over 2,000 projects from since then. Um, then I started writing books. I have 13 books out, and nine of them are in screenwriting. And I do seminars on screenwriting around the world. So I've been to, I believe, 34 countries now on six continents. And I usually do those one- to three-day seminars, but occasionally longer. I'm going to Norway in November for five days and do a seminar in Oslo. Fun. So so they're kind of exciting. It's it's all related around screenwriting. Fantastic. So since you were one of the first people, you were actually the first person to do this, um, can you explain to me, in your opinion, what the craft of screenwriting is as you see it? Well, the the craft of screenwriting has to do with understanding the structure of a story and being able to create beginning, middles, and ends. It's an understanding that a story has a plot line that has direction, and it has subplot lines that have dimension and that feed in and intersect and integrate with that plot line. So, for instance, if you were doing a crime story, the plot line or the directional story is I got to solve the crime, but the detective has a sweetheart and maybe a relationship with a parent and maybe problems with a boss, and there's other these relational dimensional aspects. 
So the writer has to balance these and know how to structure them. Then every movie, no matter what genre, has mm -hmm. a theme. There is something that this movie is about an idea. We might say it's about the human condition and who we are and what our identity is. And so the writer has to know how to integrate the theme. Then, of course, there are characters. You have your major and your supporting and your minor. Mm -hmm. and the writer needs to know how to, to uh, give dimension to a character, but also direction. So if the detective is solving the crime, they got to keep on that narrative track and keep solving the crime and not just decide to take a little vacation. <laughs> right. And then, then drama, um, you know, movies are cinematic, so they have to understand how do you create images, how do you make those images cin cinematic, visually exciting, original, unique. So I always say that screenwriting is an art, a craft, and it takes creativity. And, and the art side is mainly that voice of the screenwriter. What is it? that you are that is special, that's unique, and that you give voice through the genre you choose, through the kind of characters you decide to portray, through the stories you tell. So you're always working on all three of these aspects to learn the craft, to learn how to be a better artist. And so since you've been teaching for so long, um, and I, what, in your opinion, what is, what can really be taught and what can't be taught? And I think a lot of people have this assumption that they go to someone like you and they're like, you're going to write, you're going to help them write the, the great, you know, the great American screenplay, if you will, or the Oscar winning screenplay. I want people to understand what, what can actually be taught and what needs to come from the actual writer themselves. Well, the craft can be taught. You can actually learn how to structure a story and it will immediately improve the script. The art is something you keep having to hone and learn and to have the courage to show your voice because a lot of times people say, well, I'm going to write a script kind of like that last big hit. <laughs> this right. is not them. It's, it's not really who they are. And so you have to find what that voice is and have the confidence to keep letting it get out there. But all these things are craft. I, I had an experience which clarified this for me. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, an executive from a production company said to me, Linda, we finally figured out what you do as a script consultant. She said, we had a series of scripts come in and they were so beautifully crafted at such a high professional level, but the artistic side and the originality was not at that same level and we couldn't figure it out. <laughs> we then discovered they had all come to you as a script consultant and we understood what you did. That I said, I can only bring the craft, I can bring the craft up to a very high professional level as a consultant and people can do that reading my books or reading any books on screenwriting, going to classes, but the art has to then be raised up. And I said, I can't make the art get up to that professional level, but I can encourage and nurture the art. And many times learning the craft helps nurturing the art. Very much like, a, I don't know if this is a good analogy or not, like a chef. You can, you can teach someone how to scramble eggs, but to and, and anyone could scramble eggs, but at a certain point, it's that artistic aspect. I mean, I'm sure you've had some amazing scrambled eggs in your life uh, <laughs> and, and, and probably some bad scrambled eggs in your life. And it's similar. It's like the person who, who understands that craft and, and really gets it and then also throws in themselves into it as an artist. That's when mm -hmm. magic happens. And there's so many different parts to that craft. Um, I, having worked on so many scripts, and before that, I was a drama teacher. I taught theater at colleges and universities. I directed plays. And then when I entered the film industry, I took a series of classes, most of them through UCLA Extension, mm -hmm. just to change my mind. So I started to see scripts from the viewpoint of film, not theater. And we could say film and television. And over these 30 plus years, one learns a great deal. Mm 
Mm. So as the years have developed and I've worked on more and more scripts, I look more at things like scene transitions. Mm -hmm. How does that writer move from one scene to the next? Are they overusing flashbacks? Are they overusing voiceovers? Or do they need more voiceovers? Do, have they not set up their style? Um, how do they set up their genre? And so I'm always learning. And of course, when, whether they come to me with a class or come to me with a um, script, we're all, in a sense, I have continued to learn about the craft and the art of screenwriting all these years. And it's a lot easier, of course, for me to do my work. I have a lot more to draw on. Mm -hmm. But there's so much to the art and craft of screenwriting. Some people think it just flows. You say, yeah. no, the, the best writers... They write and they rewrite and they hone their craft and they become more confident in their art. It's, it's a continual process and it isn't that it just rolls off of you and suddenly you have an Academy Award winner. <laughs> right, right. There's, uh, there's so many people who just watch a movie and go, oh, I can do that. I can write a script. That's easy. It's similar. Like I just listened to Mozart's symphony. <laughs> I'm going to write a symphony. <laughs> it's yeah. the same concept. Like you can't just because you, you can, you can consume it and enjoy it. doesn't mean that you can do it right off the bat. It takes years and years and years of, uh, of work to do. Now, what are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen screenwriters make over the years, beginning screenwriters? Well, when I first started, most of the mistakes were structural. Mm -hmm. that they didn't get their story going, they didn't get it focused. Sometimes the first turning point was actually at the midpoint, and right. they just did not have that clear sense of beginning, middles, and ends. As the years have gone on, I have found that even the beginning screenwriters are at a higher level because they have usually read books and maybe taken a seminar or two mm -hmm. before Perhaps they, they come to me with their scripts. So one of the problems is always originality. How, right. do, you get, how do you have, how, how, how are you able to be unique and different and learn to put that out there? Um, sometimes it's a problem of development that the, Writer is not developing the characters, developing the conflict, developing the storyline. They're just sort of doing a lot of things, but it's not really happening mm -hmm. uh, there on the page. So I think development is a huge, you know, is a huge thing as well. Now, what um, over the years? Oh, what, what I was going to ask you. Um, can you explain to people what a, a studio reader it does? Because <laughs> I know a lot of people that really don't understand exactly what the reader does and, and, and what their point is. Right. Um, a reader who is sometimes called a story analyst, and I did that for several years when I first entered the business, they are the people that read the scripts and they might be handed 10 scripts a week and they go home, they read the script, they write a synopsis, usually a page or two. Then they write a paragraph or two that says, I recommend this or I don't recommend it for the following reasons. So let me just give you an, uh, a couple for instances. I was the reader on The Bodyguard. And remember that movie? The, or the, original, yeah, the original Bodyguard. Yes, with Kevin Costner. But that was originally with Steve McQueen, right? It was an older script, if I'm not mistaken. Um, oh, I don't know about that. It, uh, it, it, read, it was by Lawrence Kasdan. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and it's the one that was made with Whitney. He used of course, to, of course. When I read it, it was about a feminist comedian. And I recommended it um, but because I said, I think it's very commercial. I think it's you know, quite a good script, but it's got a big story hole in the middle of it. So in a rewrite, this has to be addressed. The person I read it read for at that time was Jane Fonda's company. Okay. And the, their executive says, oh, we think this script has problems. And I said, that's what I said. And it was, I was reading as a tryout for an ongoing job with the company and they didn't hire me. <laughs> they, they just decided they don't think that script was that good. Well, then the script got made. 
huge, huge money maker. Huge. <laughs> now has become a theater piece. I felt somewhat vindicated. Sure. And so my job, in a sense, was in that one paragraph to be able to say, this is what is good about the script. This is where the problem is. In a rewrite, fix the problem. But they didn't. Uh, I was also the reader for The Christmas Story. Oh, great movie. That plays. And there were two of us who were readers at EMI Films, and we just thought it was fabulous. The two of us talked about it before we went into the meeting with the vice president, and um, we both agreed. It was just terrific. We went into the meeting, and he was lukewarm, and we pushed at that. So a story analyst or a reader is not a decision maker, and they're really not there with the authority to solve problems. They can just point the way. They're really there to do the synopsis, that somebody can read this, who's the next person up the totem pole, and can say, oh, yes, this sounds good, or no, um, this reader has turned it down. We're not even going to bother. It doesn't have to be read by anyone else. So they're basically a gatekeeper. Yes, and the authority that they have is that when I um, when I would be a reader, if I highly recommended something, somebody else had to read it, and if I turned it down, probably it would never get read again. Mm -hmm. So that's the only authority they have, and it's a different job than the script consultant, whose mm -hmm. job is to analyze and assess and help solve the problems in the script. Right. But they're pretty powerful gatekeepers because if they don't let you through the door, you're not going to get any farther. They might not have the power to make the movie, but... Yes, they, they have the power to go through the door. And one, when I read for HBO Films many years ago, one of the things I would try to do is to follow what happened to the script that I uh, recommended. Because if the next person disagreed with me and passed on it, that really said I had not made a good decision. And most of the time that script went up at least two levels above me that said I was sorting them out. And most, uh, as a reader, I would say I recommended one out of 25, but I knew another professional reader who said hers was maybe one out of 75. She was a great reader, but somebody else said to me, that's, that's being a little bit too much of a filter. That right, you're not letting some stuff in. <laughs> yeah, because you might be missing some things that are going to be terrific with the rewrite. Like like the bodyguard. Yes. <laughs> like the bodyguard. So um, can, there is some unspoken rules in regards to how you present the screenplay to be seen by a reader is a general statement or by to be read by a you know, a producer or something like that. Things like formatting, obviously. Um, I know the, the um, oh God, I can't even remember the word, the little gold tassel things on the side of a screenplay. Please forgive me. Oh, gold tassel things. The, you know, the things that, that go into the, the things that hold the script together when you hand it. Brad. See, <laughs> thank you, thank Brad, you. I hate Brad, but yes. Yeah, there's like unspoken rules of like, if you put three in, they're not yeah, even going to look at it. I always remove the brads first thing. I said, don't even send me the brads. It just gets thrown away. Okay. But yes, that is the correct. And you have a title page mm -hmm. with your name, all your contact information on there. And usually a like a colored, you know, um, front and back. Mm -hmm. And the script is generally going to be less than 120 pages. Mm -hmm. And um, many times somewhere at 95, 105, that is very workable and um, certain margins. Most people will use final draft or a screenwriting formatting sure. program mm -hmm. to make it look in the correct font and all that. So, and then you hope it's a, it's what's called a page turner. People <laughs> right. love to read it. They keep turning the pages. Dialogue tends to be short, one to three lines. And then the next person has their dialogue and description tends to be fairly short and concise. There is a saying with readers, you want to see a lot of white. Right. I've heard that. I've heard and that. Don't have a big block of dialogue. Don't have three paragraphs of description. Unless it has Quentin Tarantino's name on it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> do whatever they want. Exactly. And it's a good idea for people getting into screenwriting to 
read scripts in your genre. So if you're a romantic comedy writer, read and study the Harry Met Sally or, um, you know, the Annie great Halls, right? comedies. Uh, I, Tootsie's probably my favorite. I do love that one. That was a great but, film. But the proposal, I mean, whatever it is that you that has done well, maybe even a comedy that's been up for some awards, read them, watch the movies, see the similarity between the two. Read early drafts if you can. And if you can, read the shooting draft. Now, let me let me ask you a question. Now, with you, you said a movie like Tootsie. And this leads into another bigger, larger question. Do you think a film like Tootsie would even be made in today's Hollywood system? Oh, I would certainly hope so. I would, I would too. It's an amazing script. Yes, I think it's a great. Uh, but in in the world that we're living in, with you know, every other movie is a superhero movie, or a now a new Star Wars movie, or or anything that's already been based on something in the past. Do you see even Hollywood being open to it? Like, I I rarely ever see originality coming out of Hollywood as much anymore. Yeah, what it's, happens is they get into the sequels and. They get into the what was good last year, and they have become, as I understand it, more and more closed to new writers. So what they do is they come up, they want to do an adaptation or whatever, they go through their Academy Award list. Right. And a lot of times, and things get rewritten, but the difficulty, particularly with studios, Studios feel they always have to bring in another writer no matter how good the script is. And I've been working with the script that I've been, actually, I've been sort of helping set it up because I happen to know some producers I thought who would be interested who are. And um, they were saying, let's go to the studio. I said, don't go to a studio. They're going to take this beautiful writer off of it. Mm -hmm. And to put on another writer who's not right for the genre, then that writer's not going to work. And I said, it is going to be in development hell for the next three or four or forever years. It would be much better. Let the studio come in when you have the picture made. And I think that's what they are going to do with this. So um, one of my favorite scripts I ever worked on out of 2,500 scripts, probably the best script, um, it has been in development hell at a studio for three years now, oh. uh, and it was it was I thought it was ready to shoot. You know, mm. now things do go through rewrites. You get the director on board, you get the producers on board, and so you say, well, okay, that's the process. No matter how good the script is, it is going to go through this process. But okay, <laughs> enough's enough. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's but go make a movie. Is, but with the production company. The writer is more apt to be part of that process. And even sometimes as a script consultant, I'm part of that process as well. So we we meet and we're a team and you're able to listen to what the producer says and say, I I see what you want to do. Okay, here's where we could do it. And then I'm talking to the writer and we're all together working it out together rather than simply taking that script and handing it to somebody else. Now, can you explain um, the concept of on-the-nose dialogue, which I think is, and cliche dialogue, is, which is, I think, one of some of the worst offenders yeah, uh, <laughs> in screenwriting today? Yeah, cliche dialogue is those things we always hear, which is, yes! I can't tell you how many times I see someone says, yes! <laughs> it's, it's overused. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the nose dialogue is say, oh, I see you're at this party. You're also eating shrimp like I am. I feel <laughs> to you. Right. So we have so much in common. We both have gone for the shrimp. <laughs> Are you attracted to me? <laughs> <laughs> like normal human beings speak. Yeah, as opposed to the subtext is you might have two people talking about the shrimp and saying, well, it's very, you know, it's very juicy. I love juicy right. Right. And all of a sudden, you say, this is really a love scene. One of the loveliest scenes to watch for subtext, where it's not on the nose, is in Sideways, uh-huh. when Maya and Miles sit down with a glass of wine, and she says, why are you so into Pinot Noir? And he starts talking about Pinot Noir, and he says, you know, it's so brilliant, and but it's subtle, and you have to coax it. And I think, Miles is talking about himself. <laughs> right. it's a love scene 
he's really saying to Maya, if you could only coax out my brilliance, like what happens with Pinot Noir, it is so rich and it's so wonderful. And right. when I show the scene in a class, I tell the class, while you're watching the scene, keep in mind they are not talking about wine. It's a love scene. They're talking about each other. And it's so cute because you suddenly start hearing the giggles. Right. <laughs> they get it. Get it. <laughs> what's, what's going on under the surface? So no. you're trying, and one of my books is called Writing Subtext. It's called, the subtitle is What Lies Beneath? Mm-hmm. And the whole idea of how do you get resonance? Um, uh, just, just to give you another example, uh, which is going to be used in the new edition of writing subtext, is that if you're doing a movie like The Proposal, and somebody like Sandra Bullock with her handsome young uh, assistant mm-hmm. says, I'm preparing him for this important meeting, you'd say that's on the nose. But if she were to say, I'm grooming him for this meeting, Now you have another level of meaning going on because, of course, they're going to end up as bride and groom. And so that the writer keeps working with the better choice of word that has resonance or that has an underlying meaning without just saying it. Right, right. And there's there's also writers that actually make a living just coming in to to clean up dialogue for sub and adding subtext where there was a lot of on-the-nose stuff. Yes, yes. And they're the rewrite that many, the uncredited rewrite in many cases. And many times that person is given a very specific assignment. If you remember Romancing the Stone years ago, of course. one of my friends, Treva Silverman, who was for many years uh, the executive story consultant on the Mary Tyler Moore show, she was called in to make Joan more likable. Right. And so they said, you don't like her. And so she started going, that was her job, to go through the script. She was a great comedy writer. And just to go through the script and say, what do I start adding? And, of course, Joan became more likable with the cat and Mm -hmm. giving her the food when she finished her book to help celebrate. And just those little tidbits. It adds a lot. Those those little, little, little things that you add to a character. Yes. Is is uh, is massive over the course of of, of the storyline. Now, uh, can you can you paint a picture for me of um, what a working writer is in Hollywood today? Not the million dollar Shane Blacks and Aaron Sorkins of the world, but like the rest of the WGA. Because I think because <laughs> <clears throat> I think a lot of writers get into the screenplay game because they all think they're going to win the lottery. Same reason why filmmakers want to make a movie because they all think they're going to go to Sundance and make you know get get win the award and Harvey Weinstein is going to write them a for you know five million bucks and the rest is history and i think i want to kind of break that notion of the million dollar lottery ticket kind of writers and what the rest because there's a lot more at the bottom of the mountain than there is at the top but there but there are working like people who make a living doing that so what can you paint a picture of what an actual working writer is in hollywood first of all a lot of writers who gain some kind of a reputation are called in either because let's say an independent producer has option to book. And let's say, for instance, they can't afford a Writers Guild writer who might start at 65000 And they're thinking, I could afford 25000 30000 I can't afford that bigger price. Mm-hmm. And so they option a book, maybe for very little money, depending, and now they're looking for a writer. And what happens sometimes with inexperienced producers, they choose the wrong writer. They choose the person who's not writing in that genre, which is what, uh, and so they, they're they writing a romantic comedy and they say, well, this person is known for, is really well known as a writer, let's get them, and maybe they're a drama writer or action writer. But they need to find a writer, and so there are many experienced writers in Hollywood or around the country. Sure who are very good at what they've done. They've probably written five scripts. Maybe they've had one movie made. Maybe they've had something optioned. And they are hired to turn that book into a script. Or somebody is has written a script and it needs a rewrite from somebody more experienced. So 
the writer gets hired. Now they can get right, hired by a production company, maybe a small one. Of course, they can get hired by a studio if they're well known, but they are hired specifically to write it. Or there's people who say, well, I want to write my life story. I want to have a screenplay based on me. I've had this happen. <laughs> it's a lot of money. Right. So, Those are always wonderful scripts, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And what happens, though, is that the writer is in a bind because this person who wants their life story told oh. doesn't know what a script is. Right. And they're trying to satisfy that person because that's the person paying them, knowing that probably it will either never get made or it will get made low budget and never see the light of day or never get any place. I mean, right. it's not going to get a release or anything. Right. So, um, what, uh, so writers, uh, there's lots and lots of experienced people out there who love these writing jobs. Now, sometimes they don't get these writing jobs in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just give you a few examples. I had a client um, to move to Florida, we had worked on an adorable script that took place in the South, a very light, lovely, charming romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. She couldn't get it made. She went over to England, and she reset it in a village in England instead of in, maybe it was Alabama, and she got it made over there. So, so many times the writer has to be thinking about, I shouldn't, Oh, the Hollywood game. I don't think I'm going to get any place. Right. Or the writer director that does a movie, very low budget, gets it into film festivals and maybe gets a job out of that. I had a writer director that I worked with who did a film for $7,000. And I'll tell you, that film looked really good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it took place on a, a desert. It was called Far From Ascension. And I, 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 I don't disclose anything I work on, but once the film is made, uh -huh. it's to everyone's advantage. For right. To give the title of it. Sure. And um, very limited sets, but sometimes people can get movies made for very little or for a hundred thousand or for half a million. Um, I know a producer director that uh, I've worked on some scripts she's given to me and I think I've recommended some and She's gotten them made, and she said, I'm very good at raising money for these, you know, small budget movies, mm -hmm. and we get them into screenwriting festival, you know, various film festivals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she said, we get a release in certain places. It's, it's never going to be the release like a studio film, but they get made. And actually, a movie I worked on with that she did is she said, we won – the award for best inspirational film, and we beat out Warner Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> that's always nice. <laughs> for the award. I said, that's pretty cool. Now, is there a place where writers can actually, you know, wh where would you suggest writers send their scripts to kind of get feedback? Because it's, you know, it's tough to, it's tough to get a, a, script, a screenplay or even read, but like festivals or contests or groups, what, what do you suggest? Yes. Well, the first thing is don't ever send anything any place without having other people having read it. Now there's different levels of readers. You, you certainly can start with people that you know, you probably know some writers, trade scripts with your friend. Just make sure that you don't give your script to somebody who is negative and is going to demoralize you. There are people that will demoralize a writer and they won't write for years. And I know some of those. Right. Of <laughs> course. It's, it's, writers. Sure. So that's the first level is just people, you know, the second level for very little money, you can have it read by a story analyst and they're going to just do a couple pages of notes and, you know, they'll give you some feedback and that can be helpful to know how will a story analyst look at this. Mm -hmm. uh, I know some people who are wonderful story analysts. So if anyone ever wanted a recommendation or mm -hmm. see ads all over, I mean, it can be 50 or a hundred dollars for that. Then the next level is the script consultant. And that's the people like me whose job it is to really analyze the script, to look at the strengths, look at the weaknesses, figure out how to make the weaknesses become strengths. Mm -hmm. So very, and I have all sorts of levels 
of services from extremely detailed to one or two pages that really give a writer a sense. This is what you have. Um, is this worth investing a lot of money in? Because maybe the story is not good enough anyway, or you really have something here. Right. You know, no guarantees and whether it'll get made. Um, then, if, then after you've gone through some steps to get professional feedback, entering screenwriting contests and see what happens. That it would, if you can get a t- one of the top three, like a third place, second, first, mm-hmm. uh, winner, whatever, and there are loads of screenwriting contests. So you want to try to make something happen with that because if you get a first place, now when you show that to a producer, you can say, by the way, it won first place. Like recently, one of a script, script I had worked on won first place at the World Fest Houston Film mm-hmm. Festival for screenwriting. And, I mean, that's worth a lot. That's a sure. wonderful award to get. So you want to have something that if you write to a production company, they have a reason to read your script. Yeah. You anything, say, anything that could give a little cachet to the script. Yes. And okay. if you can add to say, I've been writing for several years, I've written five scripts, this one I think fits your company. By the way, it's it's also won the screenwriting awards and was chosen as, I mean, something mm-hmm. that, that can help make them want to read it. Now, you touched a little bit about this earlier about uh, other markets besides Hollywood, which a lot of people always focus just on Hollywood or just the American market. But there's so many emerging film markets around the world, um, you know, that are just embracing filmmaking uh, and just blowing up as far as the the market's concerned. So how can screenwriters leverage those markets in helping them get their screenplays made? Well, the first thing is if somebody is not from the United States don't try to go to Hollywood, go to your own country. You probably have a better chance. I have a client coming in um, next week from Mexico. He went to Columbia Film School. He said, every one of us who were from outside the United States have gotten films made since we graduated Columbia 12, 15 years ago. He said, not one of my U.S. colleagues at Columbia Film School have gotten a film made. Why is that? that shows... The U.S. market is really tough. Oh, no, they've made, they made it in their own countries. Yes. And mm. so, right. And so when the, the U.S. market is the toughest, so when people from Germany or England or wherever say, well, I want to get a film made in Hollywood, say, don't even bother. Try tough. to get it made in your own market because you have a better chance in that market. And then Hollywood will come after you because they've seen this film and they think it's great and, well, let's – get that, you know, that writer. So now the other thing is somebody who is from the U S can always go to another market and say, what, what are some markets where I actually could get my script into somebody and who's doing work or doing co-productions at other markets. Mm -hmm. So Canada, for instance, Mm -hmm. or Germany or England, you've got it. If you've got some scenes in Germany, Go to German producers. And if you got scenes in England, go to England producers um, and just kind of bypass. Um, or if you don't bypass the U.S. market, go to a production company, not a studio. It's hard to get your script into a studio anyway. Right. And maybe don't go to the biggest production company. Don't start with Ron Howard's company where you probably won't get it read anyway or get in the door try to find what those smaller companies are look at the credits of movies that you love and don't look for a universal production look for that fourth name down that those producers and of course sometimes with um smaller you know smaller producers are are trying to find that writer who's just wonderful but less expensive well, yeah, so, like, like, um, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, Reese Witherspoon, uh, she actually created her own production company, uh, and started taking in scripts, and she got some really great scripts out of that, out of that, and she also produced, um, Gone Girl. <laughs> she she yes. actually got the, she got the rights to Gone Girl. Which yeah, is, and 
And look for those actors. If you want to go after an actor, look for the actors that have production companies. Mm -hmm. Because you have a better chance with that than some other way. And then, you know, the thing with agents, people say, well, can Mm -hmm. I get an agent or manager? You say, well, it'll take you years. You might do better getting a deal. And then you can go to an agent because you have proven something about yourself. It's really, really hard to get an agent and it's very, very hard to get your agent as a new writer to work for you and make anything happen. Yeah, I've, I've, I know many writers in, in L.A. <laughs> that have that problem with their agents and managers. Oh, Cause, yeah. Because they just want to make – look, they're, they're in the business to make money. And if it's much easier to sell someone who has an Academy Award <laughs> or has a proven track record than to, to hustle a, a new guy coming up. Yes, um, now, do you um, do you suggest screenwriters write scre- uh, short films or short screenplays to see if they can get that produced in a way to build a track record up? Well, especially if they're directors themselves mm-hmm. and want to do a short film. Short films, there's great opportunities at film festivals, and short films can prove who you are. They show your ability. I work on quite a few. I'm going to say quite a few. I mean, I work on short films. And one of the things I always look for uh, is to find out something in that short film that makes the writer-director known. So don't just do another car chase. They can get, you know, Michael Mann to do the car chase. They don't need you. Do something interesting, whether it's in the writing of it or the approach to it, so that you can start getting awards with the short film and someone looking at it says, oh, that director is, they're they're not only good at what they're doing, but wonderful script, you know, great job at directing. So, um, again, you have something to show. And it doesn't have to be a 30-minute film. There's a lot of fabulous films, a six minutes or ten minutes. In fact, years ago, I worked on a um, short film. It was called There Is No April, and the two characters were named May and June. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Two, it was six minutes. It was two women on their way to Las Vegas where one was going to get a quickie divorce. And the, uh, the writer said, I want to do this little film and then I'm going to do a feature. And she was sort of dismissing that little film. And I, her name was Cherry Norris. And I said, Cherry, take that little six-minute film very seriously. So she hired me as a script consultant. She hired a directing consultant and the film won Audience Favorite Award at the Albany Film Festival. Mm-hmm. And she then went on to do a, an adorable little romantic comedy called Duty Dating. Mm-hmm. And I, she might have done a film since then. But um, it was interesting to say everything you do, you do with the same professionalism as when you finally get the opportunity to do the, the feature. Right. Don't ever dismiss anything. Now, the structure of a, of a short screenplay, a short film screenplay must be obviously much different in the same, but much more condensed. So you have to get to those beats much faster, I would imagine, yes. right? Yeah. I still structure it in the three-act structure, sure. the clear beginning, middle, and end. Mm-hmm. And even with this little um, uh, There Is No April, I, I looked very carefully at the structure. She had her turning point. She had her development. She had her conflict. Everything was in there, but you only have six minutes to do it. So it's a, it's, it's a much, it's even a tougher chore, chore than doing a, a 90 minute script at that point. Well, I don't know if it's tougher, <laughs> different, it's really, you know, tough. And it is interesting to see how well many of these do. I, I think every short film I've won, I've worked on has won awards. And, uh, and sometimes I remember one, one writer early on many years ago said, you were the only person who believed in this. And he said, and that kept me going. And I did my little short and it won these five awards. And, uh, you know, what a, what a nice thing is to start to see and get some kind of success. Cause you can write for years and years and years and not get any feedback that tells you, oh, you did a good job on that. Right. And that does help. As, a, as an artist, you want that reinforcement. 
uh, yeah. reassurance, if you will, like, hey, I'm I'm on the right track. I'm actually good at what I'm doing. Maybe I can keep. I should keep trying to do this because it's a, it's not a um, it's not a sprint. This is definitely a marathon. <laughs> right. and you have to figure it is going to take you years. So unless you love doing doing it, unless you love the writing, don't even bother. No one is waiting for you. <laughs> the only thing that is going to keep you going is you feel inside yourself passionate about what you're doing and you are keep going through the learning curve. Yeah, absolutely. Now one, um, <clears throat> one, one thing I, uh, I've, when I've been, when I went to started uh, studying screenplay writing and, and um, all the books and you obviously your, your books are on the top of that list. Uh, the one book that really kind of, um, or the, the concept I guess was uh, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, which yes. um, that kind of changed the game for um for storytelling in the last 30 40 when did that come out he, he when did he release that well i know that it was in the early to mid 80s after star wars came out which right. actually i think was more like 77 or something right correct I guess 77 yeah. but when star wars came out and uh jo- and george lucas started to talk about how he had used joseph campbell's theories mm-hmm. then People started to look at Joseph Campbell, and then Christopher Vogel wrote the book called The Writer's right. Journey, which deals with the hero's journey. And I, I did some parts in my Making a Good Script Great on the hero's journey in the first two editions. And I actually told Christopher, I said, you need to write a book on this, and if you don't in two years... I'm going to, but that's not the book I want to write. It's the book <laughs> you should write. And once in a while, Chris thanks me. He said, I'm really glad you pushed me because that book has been extremely well received and, and done extremely well. Oh, yeah. I've read that book a, a, a ton of times. Yeah. yeah, like I do with doing seminars on that. So um, one can get Joseph Campbell kind of put down into screenplay form by reading Chris's book. Right, it kind of like yeah, because Joseph Campbell's is more mythology. It's it's not focused specifically on filmmaking, while Chris Chris's book is. That's what I loved about his uh, his book as well. Um, now, uh, what when there uh, when is there's writing a screenplay, and then there's also marketing a screenplay and getting your voice out there as a screenwriter. Do you have any tips on how you can get that script that they finally made out there into the world, like and yeah. actually get seen? Yes, well, that's that's, that's, the, that's the golden ticket. <laughs> that's, that's a whole world in itself. But one thing people can do, mm-hmm. um, they can go to conf- screenwriting conferences that have pitch fest. Mm-hmm. One of the best is there's the Great American Pitch Fest in Los Angeles. That's usually in June. It is put on by a woman from Canada in Calgary named Cigna, who is just fabulous. It is so well organized. She gets so many people there to receive pitches. Hundreds and hundreds of people go. And so you have an opportunity to do that five-minute pitch in front of people who actually have the ability to buy your, your script. Then Story Expo in September has a pitch fest, which is getting bigger and bigger. And it's the same thing. You, you go there, you have your one sheet, Plus, you have your screenplay and your briefcase. And when they say, I'm interested, you give them the one sheet. And the next day, you send them the script if they say they're willing to read it. Get it there really quickly. (laughs) Very quickly. And there's been a lot of successes with something like these pitch fests. Uh, There's one in, I think there is one in Canada. And I would even suggest that some of the Americans go up to Canada and do that with Canadian producers. And again, you might have a better chance. Um, Just less competition, basically. It's less competition. And there is a cachet, maybe not in Canada, but other parts of the world that like, oh, this is a a U.S. and an American screenwriter, a Hollywood screenwriter. It might have some more cachet, might have more pull uh, in in a marketing standpoint. (laughs) Yes, yeah. And Possibly. So look, there are some things where people put their synopses online, and you have to be kind of careful about that because it's easier to steal mm-hmm. that. And I do know some people have done well with that. I think there are some of those um, sponsors of those kind of synopses that actually say they can get it into producers and 
getting into executives and maybe the executives sort of thumb through there and just take a look to see if there's anything of interest. I don't know um, just overall what mm -hmm. the percentages are. They're probably quite low, but then everything is quite low. Now, can you, uh, can you really briefly talk about log lines, which is something that a lot of people don't talk about and the importance of them? Oh, yeah. Log lines are that one line that immediately encapsulates your story. For instance, if I said a shark threatens a tourist town on a 4th of July weekend. Yes. The Jaws. I loved E.T. E.T. was fantastic. No, I'm yeah. joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and something with Jaws is you listen to that log line. It has conflict on it. You use the word threatens. It has high stakes. It's the 4th of July weekend, which says this is the tourist dollars, as he mm -hmm. says. And it's a shark, so it's the man against monster story. In one line, you have so much information. And so a writer works and works on that log line because if you go to a pitch fest, you might want to have that log line to pull the person in immediately that you are pitching to. The other thing that you work on is what's called the elevator pitch, which is the 22nd right. pitch. Mm -hmm. So you get into an elevator and you press the 12th floor and you turn around and Steven Spielberg is standing behind you. <laughs> That's when you go into your, I have a script, a shark threatens us. <laughs> <laughs> Probably don't pitch that story to him. I think he knows you that one. <laughs> that pitch to say, I got to say that because I just happen to have this opportunity. Yeah. Let me see what that person says. And you, again, make it very, very concise. Um, Michael Haig has written a book called, I think it's Selling uh, the Selling Your Script in 60 Seconds. It's something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. about pitching and it's about treatments and, um, you know, these, these log lines. And it's that whole idea. You have to be able to get that script very, very concise that somebody immediately gets What's the genre? What's the stakes? What's the conflict? Give me something about, you know, my, maybe my main character might right. be in there. Give me lots of information. So um, I wanted just to, uh, to kind of close off our, our interview uh, with uh, two movies that I wanted you to kind of talk about a little bit. And um, two of them are considered two of the great, uh, great screenplays ever written. But, um, uh, one and they're very different from each other. Uh, one movie is Shawshank Redemption, which is considered probably one of the greatest films uh, ever made, um, at least by IMDb standards. <laughs> um, what makes that movie so ridiculously amazing? Uh, and it, from and I've talked to every every scope of life, uh, you know, for every everybody from you know millionaires to you know kids to like people love that movie uh and it wasn't wasn't widely loved when it first came out but it's grown and and, and there's this thing about it can you kind of break that down and then the other movie um story well, i'll tell you about the other movie afterwards what do you think about both, and then I'll, I'll go to the okay uh, the other one is pulp fiction like how that yeah. that magic of what that is you know, these are the greatest movies of all time i'm not sure i would no what well, some of them i didn't say but, the but, most but, but some of them say they are both you know they are both very good um they're both excellent um and I say well what is it about them um shawshank uh, i think and the the feeling for the characters and their situation and their context is so uh, strong. I mean, you, you imagine with Morgan Freeman, he just pulls you into that story. Oh, so beautiful. Tim Robbins. And, and memorable scenes. One of the things to look for in a movie is what are the scenes you probably have not seen before that carry so much emotion, so much feeling? It, because that's where you go into the art, not the craft. Of course, mm -hmm. Shawshank is based on Stephen King's story. Sure, but, sir. When I think of Shawshank and I think of that scene where Tim Robbins goes into the room and locks the door and plays a, a piece of classical music, it's an opera, and he puts it on the intercom and it just floods the prism and everybody just is brought to a halt by the beauty, to bring beauty into that. And, oh my gosh, the feeling of that scene. Um, 
So sometimes in movies, when you analyze them, you, for, for instance, structurally, Shawshank, I, I think the resolution is too long in that movie. Mm-hmm. And so from just a purely structural craft viewpoint, I think it could have been tighter. But from an artistic viewpoint, just uh, a story that pulls you in and the twist and turns of the story, mm-hmm. the fact that this guy kept getting his Rita Hayworth posters <laughs> so he could dig behind them and what it took and, and themes of determination. So you can look to say it's a great story, it's great characters, it's actable roles that really bring great actors to the table. It's a theme that is expressed and um, it has, in that case, the twist and turns. Pulp Fiction is such an original piece. Mm -hmm. It had very little money to shoot it with, low budget, lots of fascinating things. I mean, the guy has just shot the person, and he starts quoting from the Bible. (laughs) (laughs) My gosh, (laughs) what is this? And the sure hand, uh, I, I think the thing with Quentin Tarantino, by the time he did Pulp Fiction, he knew what he was doing. He said he had spent 10 years doing a movie that couldn't even be released. It was so awful. Sure. Then he did Reservoir Dogs. Then he did Pulp Fiction. And I remember in that opening scene in the cafe that when he stopped that, he starts the credit and there's belly dancing music. I mean, it, it happened years ago. I, I the, sur- the, sur- the surfing music, I right? I used to belly dance to that. Sure killer piece of music (laughs) and then he starts the movie again in a totally different place and i totally trusted quentin tarantino knew what he was doing he was not going to drop that scene we were going to come back to it and to uh, feel that sense of a writer director who knows what they're doing and has a sure and confident hand um right um, that's a great analogy of that how he just interwove all of this and still hitting the beats still hitting that that uh, yes. he, he hit he hit that hero's journey oddly enough within that structure and he also i analyze pulp fiction in terms of its structure and it's beautifully structured i think right at the midpoint is the story of the watch mm-hmm. which acts as kind of a fulcrum for the first half and the second half um does and, and the interweaving is really fascinating because he'll drop something for a while, but then you know he's going to come back to it. You know the funny, the funny. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a real quick funny story about the Pulp Fiction. Is uh, I was listening to an interview with um, Robert Rodriguez, and he was talking about um, he was he was you know their best friends, and they've been and they were doing the the movie at the time, and just like George Lucas had that screening of Star Wars for you know the Palma and Coppola and. All that, uh, and everyone said, "Oh, poor George!" <laughs> Except, <laughs> poor, poor George. He just, yeah. Well, maybe next one, George Spielberg was the only one that kind of like you might have something here. Uh, Quentin did the same similar thing with uh, with Pulp Fiction. He brought in all his 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 friends, um, which were filmmakers and writers and stuff. And Robert was the only one that wasn't there. He was off shooting somewhere. But uh, after the screening, he talked to some people, and one of the, the, the one of the directors who will remain nameless because no one knows who it is because Quentin won't say <laughs> who it is. Right. He's like, you know, I'm going to have a stern talking to about with with Quentin about this. I mean, he needs to learn how to make a movie. I mean, this is not right what he's done. I think he's gone off course. And then he was going to make that phone call, but then. Quentin was over in France with at Cannes. So after he won the Palme d'Or, <laughs> his, <laughs> yes. his friend calls him up and goes, I was going to give you a stern talking to, but what the hell do I know? Congratulations. Well, and Pulp Fiction has what I call the loop structure, is that you loop it back. And uh, Quentin, who quotes uh, some somebody else, says, you know, a story has a beginning, middle, and end, but not necessarily in that order. Correct. And in my book, Advanced Screenwriting, I talk about different non-traditional structures and use Pulp Fiction as the example of the loop. And, and just an unusual structure, but he knew what he was doing. That confident hand is, is something that... Um that I, it's a great, and it's a great description of, of, of Quentin Tarantino as a filmmaker. He, he's going to go down his route no matter what 
he, what you think about it, but he knows he's going to take you in, the, in this journey. It's kind of like when I saw Birdman last year. And, yes. and I was like, oh, I forgot what a real director is like. <laughs> yeah, somebody knows what they're doing, and, they, and this is not their first rodeo. Right. It just like took you through this. First time they have done this. And it's so, I I just still remember watching Birdman and going, this is what a director's like. You like, you watch it when you watch a Scorsese movie or one of the, you know, the big, but I hadn't seen a movie so original and completely, I mean, he took you on that journey and you trusted him the entire time. Yes. Um, And it was, uh, it was a one, and I'm so glad I won the Oscar. It was like such an odd choice for, uh, you know, for the, for the Academy, but I thought it was a wonderful choice. Um, So last question, my dear, is the toughest question of them all. So prepare yourself. I asked this of all of my, uh, all of my guests. What are your top three films of all time? Oh, okay. Uh, The the best. Yeah. Uh, In in your opinion. There's so many, but let me just mention a couple I particularly find is gems. One is, Always Amadeus. Yeah, yeah, you're not. I just had someone else say Amadeus is a wonderful yes, film. Big Diamond, the mm-hmm. really big one. You know, like Gone with the Wind. Those are the the big diamonds. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you say the top three films, uh, I, I wouldn't know how to answer that. I could answer it in terms of movies that I am incredibly fond of. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, no so, rules. No rules. Like my some of my favorite now. People know I talk about Witness a lot, and I have talked about it for many, many years. I think it is one of the best structured films, and these guys really knew what they were doing in telling the story. Of course, I have a special feeling for Witness. My husband, who at that time was the guy I was dating, sort of kind of proposed to me in the middle of the barn raising scene. (laughs) Sort of kind of. (laughs) <laughs> and then the proposal became specific, and now we've been married for it'll be 29 years next oh, year. Congratulations! Uh, so uh, I have a real feeling. Uh, comedies, I put Tootsie sure. kind of at the top, very thematic, very strong, um, just you know, wonderful acting, wonderful characters, great idea behind it. Um, so those are three. And then I'll just mention what I call a little gem. The little mm-hmm. diamond, mm-hmm. Stand By Me. I love Stand uh, By Me. Great and movie. Stand By Me, to me, is a great example of a very small film of 12-year-old boys and how a film can be about that and pull somebody in who ordinarily would not be pulled into that film. If somebody said, what is one of the least interesting things to you, as I would say, 12-year-old boys, because they make me so nervous. <laughs> they, they walk on railroad tracks when trains are ready to come. You know, all of that. And I said, I love that film. I, I just think it's a great example of dimensionality and heart and having a this little directional line, let's go find a dead body, and all the stuff about friendship. It's just, um, I, I call that the little diamond Absolute gem of a little movie. Wonderful list. Wonderful list. So, uh, Linda, where can people find you? Um, LindaSager.com is my website. Um, my email, Linda at LindaSager.com. S-E-G-E-R. Think of Bob Seeger if you're not sure how to, how to find me. Sure. And it's the same spelling. Um, and I got a full website. There's a whole lot of stuff on there so that people will probably find interesting. And you have many, you've written 13 books, correct? Yes. There's nine of them are in screenwriting. Okay. Um, and then you also do, co- you also do uh, consulting as well as um, workshops every once in a while? Yes. Mo- most of my work is script consulting. Mm-hmm. And then I do seminars. So my next one is Norway. Mm-hmm. And um, I was in Europe all summer long doing Vienna and Germany and England and Paris. And it's a tough life, tough life. Just, yeah, yeah. It's a tough life. Of, I think I did seven in nine weeks, and I just went from one country to the other with little vacation time in there. <laughs> so, uh, But I'm pretty easy to find. Okay, fantastic. Linda, thank you so much for taking out the time to talk to us. We really appreciate it. Okay, and you can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter and um, also sign up for my newsletter. Absolutely. Thanks again, Linda. Thanks so much. It was an absolute pleasure talking to Linda. She really dropped some major knowledge bombs on the tribe today. And I I really do appreciate uh, her taking the time out 
to talk uh, to us. So thank you, Linda, very much. If you want links to anything we talked about in this episode, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash BPS008. That's Bulletproof Screenplay, BPS008. And guys, if you have not signed up and subscribed for this podcast on iTunes, please do so. Go over there, leave us a good review. Give us a hopefully a five-star review. It really helps us out, especially in these first few weeks that we're out because it's going to help us rank on iTunes and get this information out to as many screenwriters as humanly possible. So just head over to screenwritingpodcast.com. And as always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenplay Podcast at BulletproofScreenplay.com. That's B-U-L-L-E-T-P-R-O-O-F-S-C-R-E-N-P-L-A-Y dot com. 